So if you have a limited amount of dollars, that dollars goes long way building out of India, say compared to Bay Area. Basically, you know, in the early days of building of the product, most of your cost is human resources cost, which is your engineering cost. And with the cost of living advantage in India, you could do a lot more sitting in India in early days uh, where you can create a product that is uh, equivalent or sometimes better than the what is product available. Welcome back, dear listeners, to an exciting new season of the Insights podcast series from Axel. I'm your host, Anand Daniel. We started off this year with a Twitter poll on topics to cover in our podcast, and thanks to all those who enthusiastically participated. The main feedback was around diving deeper into specific market segments and topics relevant for founders. We are actioning on that feedback and kicking off this new season with a deeper look into SaaS as a market over a few episodes and the exciting potential SaaS has in store for founders. Joining me today are Shekhar Kirani from Axel and Chris Subramanian, co-founder and CEO of Chargebee. Chargebee is one of the leading SaaS payment platforms globally. It services customers across 53 countries, processing over $3 billion of annual invoicing. Shaker and Axel have been part of the Charge B journey from its seed stage in 2014. Shaker and Krish have a wealth of information to share for budding entrepreneurs about SaaS in this episode. Let's dive right in. Hi, um, I'm excited to have Shaker Kirani and Krish from Charge B here uh, to talk about SaaS. That's the focus today why SaaS is an exciting area for starting up, as well as how to go about evaluating ideas and starting up in SaaS. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Shikhar, maybe a quick background of your involvement in SaaS, and then over to you, Krish, to introduce Charge B and what you do at the current scale. Thanks, Anand. So I'm uh, Shikhar Kirani. I've been, I've been with Axel in India for the last uh, eight years. Uh, I have focused uh, my time in specializing in investments in software as a service, uh, early stage seed startups. I have been involved with Freshworks, Chargebee, Zenoti, Browser Stack, uh, Answer, and many other software as a service companies. As Axel, we have done around 30 plus uh, software as a service startups in India where we have invested and uh, all together. Uh, I think they will be crossing at least $500 million plus worth of ARR by end of 2020 and uh, a significant demonstration of uh, what is possible to build from India for global markets and uh, excited to be here to talk about what at least we have learned and why this is a great time for entrepreneurs to jump in and do extraordinary startups in SaaS and also feel great to be partnering on this podcast with uh, Krish. Awesome. Thank well, you. welcome to the podcast, Krish. I'd uh, love to hear a little bit about currently the scale of uh, Charge B. Thanks, Shekhar. Thank you, Anand. Excited to be here. So my name is Krish uh, Subramanian, co-founder and CEO of Charge B. Uh, Charge B is a software as a service platform uh, for other SaaS companies. Uh, we specialize in subscription management and billing, uh, serving customers in 53 countries, processing over $3 billion of annual invoicing of our customers, um, processing uh, millions of subscriptions around the world. Uh, we bootstrapped the company uh, in the initial year and a half, and then we have raised over uh, $39 million of uh, uh, capital over the last uh, six years. Um, and uh, we have close to 400 people operating out of four different countries. Oh, congrats. Thank you. Great. So first question is for a first time founder who might not know too much about SaaS. Yeah, help us understand that. Either of you can start. Yeah. Yeah. So I think before SaaS, the question is, what is software? Okay. Right. And if you look at historically over 40 to 50 years, software industry has been uh, developed uh, over the years. Initially, people used to buy hardware and software used to come free. And then when hardware got generic, 
people started buying software, but we're al- almost always on-prem. But in the last 15 years or so, with the cloud happening, where the hardware and the software layer is separated out, and secondly, where the, 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 the software access is done via either mobile app or browser, there is a lot of decoupling happening in the software industry itself. And the SaaS is a new era of the software. Literally, if there is any company starting out today, they have to be, uh, most likely they'll be starting as software as a service, where software is delivered, not as a CD or a package, but delivered over the internet, like your telephone service, and you're subscribing to that service for your need. And secondly, the capability of the the business models, lots of variations of business model. Most common one is a subscription-based business model which uh, Krish will talk about. But the most fundamental thing is you can build software, de- deploy in the cloud and deliver that software to any customer anywhere in the world, uh, independent of where you are. And that is the power of software as a service. Great. Krish? Um, if I may add, my favorite example is always uh, power of uh, the delight of Gmail, right? We have all uh, accessed Gmail. Um, and one fine day when you just fire up the browser and then you uh, start typing, please find attached. And then you miss the attachment. And then the software tells you, did you miss the attachment? Right. And that was actually a moment of realization. Then you actually feel the power of software without actually owning the software. That browser-based software can get smarter and smarter every day without you actually lifting a finger to improve your software. Now, apply that delight to in a business context where a business software continues to improve without having internal developers, without spending a lot of time thinking about maintenance, when I could be running a hotel chain, but focusing on my customers rather than trying to think about IT infrastructure. That's the magic of SaaS. Got it. That's that's very helpful. And then subscription was, where does that fit in? So SaaS is a software delivery model, right? That is browser-based software. The revenue model is something where subscriptions have existed for a century, right? Magazine and paper subscriptions have existed forever. In software parlance, we have all paid for um, antivirus software where the value is in the virus signatures, right? But your software is owned by you, right? That was even as recently as just 15, 20 years back. Mm -hmm. And now what is shifting is now from a Heavy investment where software used to be owned only by large enterprise companies which can afford to buy the software and maintain the software that is shifting drastically to small companies that are able to spend it as an operational expense and own software. Right? And, and that operational expense is a, a small ticket amount, which is it could be as low as 100 rupees. Right? Gmail is available for 100 rupees. Zoho software is now available for as low as uh, 50 rupees or 100 rupees in certain countries, right, for business software. And and that month-on-month payment as you pay as you go model and that variation is what we call as a subscription revenue model. Got it. Versus how software used to be before, Shaker, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So software was always purchased as one time Mm -hmm. license and you got access to the software to use and you have to deploy on-prem with your own team, then customize that software for your need. Then you would pay annually kind of the maintenance charge for upgrades that would come every three, four years. But in the new model, software gets upgraded every week, maybe every month, sometimes every day. And because the delivery model is on the cloud, you don't control the delivery model, but you get the benefits of upgrades continuously. And the flip side is you pay as you go, which means when you use, you pay. And if you don't use, then you don't pay. So as a subscription business model, software is not getting wasted in the sense that it's not a shelfware anymore. If you don't have a high quality product that doesn't serve the purpose, less likely it gets used. So the subscription models are becoming a mainstream way of how enterprises are buying software today. Got it. So now we understand software that's delivered from uh, the cloud right, to wherever you are, and the model could be subscription. So that way you pay as you go. So you don't have to end up putting a lot of money up front. So we get all that. So help us understand the types of SaaS. Uh, com- uh, it could be companies, products, solutions. How do we break down this world? Yeah, so there, there are two ways to think about it. If I'm thinking from an entrepreneur perspective, if I'm thinking about starting a software as a service startup, then let's talk from that perspective. Right. So if you think from an entrepreneur perspective, 
you can divide the horizon of uh, SaaS startups in multiple ways. One is by segment of the customers you want to attack, either like a small customer or a medium-sized customer or an enterprise or a large enterprise uh, customer. And their needs as the scale of the company that is buying the software changes, then the type of activity and the type of product you have to build is different. That is one by scale of the buyer. The second one is the domain. In the sense, are you building a product that is very much horizontal in nature, which means any customer anywhere in the world can buy this product and use. Uh, for example, CRM is one good example. A support tool is another good example. It's a functional product that can be used by anyone or whether it is a vertical domain purpose built for that domain, such as, you know, we have several examples of that. For example, Chargebee itself is a subscription domain. For subscription companies, they build it. Zenoti is for uh, spa salons, wellness industry companies. We have uh, uh, CareStack, which is building it for dentists, which is for domain specific, where the product is built for that domain. That is the second way to think about. The third way to think about is what regional uh, focus you want to have. So many companies are starting out building it out for India and then India and Southeast Asia. Some of the companies are building it for Western market markets like US and Europe. So different ways you can think about when you are thinking about how uh, as an entrepreneur, when you're initially thinking about a, a startup, either on the scale of the size of the company or a domain or region. Got it. That's that's very helpful. So, Krish, anything to add to that, particularly your platform? Yes, you're vertically focused on subscription, but your platform is used across domains, I'm guessing. So anything to add uh, to how, how would you look at the SaaS world? From the types of buyers to the domains to the regions, like is that how, we sh uh, how you view the world or how should entrepreneurs think about these uh, uh, the types of SaaS companies as they look to start? Right. Um, I'll, I'll quote a few examples mm. uh, to demonstrate the point. Right. Um, there are different types of customers who use Chargebee. Right. Chargebee itself is an example of a SaaS company serving other SaaS businesses, mm -hmm. right, and other subscription businesses. But to move away from Chargebee to make it easier, I'll focus on a few examples of customers. For example, Ask Nicely is one of our customers from New Zealand and USA. Right. This is a review software. Right. And, and it's not just review; it is also the customer satisfaction and reviews that you get for any service. Who needs customer satisfaction? Any business that has a need to get customer feedback needs it. But Ask Nicely is a product deliberately focuses on a certain type of industry in which they want to help the get the customer feedback loop and enable that industry. Then if you focus on a single industry, right, or specific industries, then you are considered a vertical software, mm. right? It could be e-commerce, right? It could be, uh, let's say, industrial automation, right? Or you could actually say, my software will enable you to write support tickets to anyone. Support at any business, xyz.com is the same, right? Whether you write to Amazon or anybody else, right? You write an email to a support email ID, then I convert that into a ticket, and then you actually go through the same process of horizontal software, right? So these are multiple ways in which we see um, software evolving. But the beautiful opportunity that I see, uh, the ways in which entrepreneurs around the world are now building companies is that, Anybody who is now understanding a problem deep enough is able to go solve the problem really well. A classic example, my favorite, one of my favorite examples is uh, these two founders uh, of uh, this company called Rapid Tender, bootstrap uh, company, uh, two guys from New Zealand from the very school days, uh, very early school days. And then they did not even meet. They took different paths. One became an electrical engineer. Another one became a software engineer, mm -hmm. immigrated to UK. And then they happened to meet there seven years back. And then they created this company called Rapid Tender, which specializes in electrical bidding, RFPs, right? How do you bid for that technical bid? How do you submit that for construction? Mm -hmm. And they have created a bootstrap multi-million dollar business focusing on one industry vertical because the one person understands the problem of RFPs and how to actually bid. The other one knows how to create SaaS. Mm -hmm. So you can create SaaS companies, wherever, whichever industry, however you understand it, but the key is understanding a particular customer problem or understanding a particular industry and think that there is a better way to do it through SaaS. So these two guys sitting out of UK somewhere uh, coded up the software and started selling it, didn't raise any outside money and, and or now... Not at all. Yeah, and they have not raised any capital at all. Multi-million dollars of revenue, that's right? So that's, that's the beauty of SaaS companies here, right? So 
maybe I want to flip that around. So we talked about type of SaaS companies. Either you pick vertical domains or you go broad. Then you pick the type of customers you want to sell to, small, medium, large, or the region you want to sell in India or you want to sell across the globe, all these. So let's, I want to turn around for the Indian founders who are listening. What's the advantage of doing this out of India? Right? So right. Shaker, you start and then uh, okay. Krish can pitch uh, it. So good. Um, you know, the, the, uh, there are fundamental changes that has happened in the world today that gives uh, advantage to India to compare to anywhere else. The very first one is the buyer behavior. So before buyers of any software tend to meet the seller face to face and then buy. But in the most recent years, because software can be evaluated and tested before I meet the sales folks, uh, software can originate from anywhere. So there's a decoupling of buyer and seller uh, that gives an edge for anyone anywhere in the world to produce a world-class product and they have the same opportunity uh, to succeed in building a, a global product. That we have seen already examples, Atlassian coming out of uh, Australia, uh, able to show that it can build a world-class product from, uh, uh, from Australia for the rest of the world. And are, are from India or Freshworks and Zoho, many of the companies coming out of India at scale, able to build for globally. So that is the first fundamental change that gives benefit, not only for entrepreneurs in India, but anywhere in the world, mm. right? The second advantage is that the amount of money you need to have to have your MVP and have a product that people appreciate. A minimum viable a product. A minimum viable product that is people would appreciate and you have a chance to succeed in that. So if you have a limited amount of dollars, that dollars goes long way building out of India, say compared to Bay Area. Why is that? Uh, so the, basically, you know, in the early days of building of the product, most of your cost is human resources cost, which is your engineering cost. And with the cost of living advantage in India, typically one is to four or sometimes one is to five advantage, you could do a lot more sitting in India in early days uh, where you can create a product that is uh, equivalent or sometimes better than the what is product available and be able to compete with a less amount of money compared to what one would need, say, in if you are building this company out of Bay Area. That's the second advantage. Sure. So maybe I can add yeah. uh, with our example, uh, which is our own story here. Uh, so Charge B was started by four of us founders. Three of my co-founders come from Zoho, who, who were part of building product journey for over 10, 12 years when it started as Advanet and then also morphed into Zoho. And because, and I come from software background, but then mostly implementing products for large customers. But when four of us got together, we had the most of the skills necessary to go build a product. And all we needed was we just took over one of the one apartment of one of the founders, put a screen there, and then one side became the office. And we built this company without a server, right? All we needed was internet, and then we just got our laptops, and then we started building this product for over close to a year, right? And we deployed this. Our first website was on Amazon Web Services on a micro instance, which was free. There was no traffic. There was no need to spend any money, right? And our first check-in was on GitHub when we paid ten dollars um, for private account, and that's it, right? And all you pay for is internet. And uh, if you have the technical chops and understanding of a problem, you can create software from anywhere in the world. And we were competing eight years back. We were competing. We were trying to take on a company that was funded hundred million dollars mm -hmm. out of an apartment in Velacheri in mm -hmm. Chennai, and that level playing field is possible today because of the cloud infrastructure that's available and the democratization of this opportunity that you can create software from anywhere in the world as long as you understand a customer problem, customer context and the problem anywhere in the world. I think it, it's a fantastic starting point yeah. To, to, to yeah leveling field, level playing field to get started with uh, launching a product. I think that leads to the second part which is okay now that you may have a product Right, with some understanding of customer problem, then what's the advantage? Yeah. So we heard about the apartment startup, like garage startup, there's an apartment <laughs> startup. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Most of the startups in India are apartment startups. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've talked about those two. You can sell to anyone and then you can build a lot more cost efficiently out of India. Yes. Right. And the third part is, it doesn't matter what type of product you build, you still need human assistance 
uh, either predominantly post sales during implementation and also to some extent customer support. And that is where you know the advantage you get out of India because there's a significant number of trained, qualified uh, talent in India, which has done for services over a long period of time of this kind of activity. So we can, if entrepreneur wants to do a 24 by 7 support, which most of the Western early stage startups don't do it, you have an edge saying that you can keep customer in the center and do that service much better so that your NPS is higher, your net promoter score is higher, and therefore there's a higher chance of you being successful. That's the third point. And and the BPO industry and all that has helped develop the talent for that over a Plus the domain expertise, right? Yeah. So and the you, last you one is the domain expertise. Yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead, Krish. Right. Any, any particular domain you take, like healthcare or uh, supply chain, right? There are so many people who actually are in the service industry for over the last 30 years, the talent pool has been developed, where we understand a global customer context and having an understanding of the problem. And then you bring that to the service side of this software business, software as a service business, where you are able to deeply understand a customer problem and then are able to assist them in, be it in any role. It could be product management, pre-sales, customer success. But how do you deliver? You have built a solution for a problem that you understand and to take it to the customer and deliver value, you need the people who are able to understand the, the customer problem, assist them better. Hmm. right? And that talent pool is available from the service industry. It's a massive advantage, right? So wherever you build it from, right? One part we talked about is you can build software from anywhere. Mm -hmm. The next part is every region has its own advantages. What advantage do we have in India that we can actually build on to build your own unfair advantage through which you get your first step, right? Go from the zero to one journey, Mm -hmm. right? I think that is where the the software service uh, industry has a huge advantage in tapping into the service industries domain expertise and the huge talent pool that is available. Got it. So has anyone demonstrated putting all this together and shown, uh, I'm thinking of some re- reasonable scale, taking on global competition? Yeah, you know, uh, before we get there, Anand, yeah, sure. I think the last advantage I want to say, which is more a personal plug, mm. is there is significant number of investors and investment dollars available in India today Mm -hmm. for this category of companies. Mm. So when at least we started as Axel in 2010-11 on this category, we were only few who were chasing these kind of startups. Now with significant number of success that is coming out of India, there are several uh, seed funds, angels, uh, early stage funds, as well as uh, VC firms and growth investors. Everybody is aware of the power of these cross-border software as a service companies coming out of India for global markets. And if you look at the momentum that is building it out, and if I kind of take another five, 10 year horizon, this is a a mainstream category. And if I'm an entrepreneur today, and if I'm thinking of starting a startup, I would consider software as a service startup at a much higher consideration compared to any other type of startup. Right. I think the, the massive advantage we cannot ignore is one, there are it's just about optionality. Yes. One, you can bootstrap your company if you have the technical chops, you can hire the right talent, and you also have the option of actually raising raising capital when you are presented with an opportunity where you can really go big. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, it's it's a trifecta of all these things that comes together, which makes us very, very interesting at this point in time. Got it. Cool. So, but you talked about investing from 2011-12 in this space, doing a seed uh, so what has changed and what are the proof points that founders should be aware of? Yeah. Why is this hap- actually arrived or, or arriving rather than a theory? See, the, the, there are at least significant number of examples now and case studies from India, people building large scale companies. There is playbooks available. You know, earlier days it was to be Zoho, but now we have uh, Freshworks at a scale that is like at a global level. Maybe a minute on both. What is Zoho and then what's their scale, right? Yeah, so, you know, Zoho has been uh, probably, I think, 20 years. uh, 22-year company, uh, right? The the numbers are private, Mm -hmm. but they have 7,000 people, 25 different products or even 40 products uh, that serves over 25 million users around the world. Yeah. Yeah. And they're bootstrapped, right? They never raised outside capital. 
Yeah, and then uh, in SaaS, a good scale is hundred million revenue. Right, probably are, they are a few hundred million dollars in revenue. Uh, I would million. say so several hundred million. Several. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so which is <laughs> phenomenal. Phenomenal. Sitting out of Chennai, is, uh, which and is then purely using the profits to scale this company, yeah. and uh, and then if you look at Freshworks, which was one of our earlier investments uh, as a seed, uh, it's a company now at a several hundreds of million dollar. Uh, ARR company serving more than 130 countries across the world uh, with most of the product built out of India with uh, global outreach, uh, small sales teams across the world. And if you look at that scale with a playbook and still continuously growing and have raised significant amount of uh, uh, venture uh, money to fuel that growth, then other examples are like Browser Stack, which has grown profitably bootstrapped until recently. Uh, where you know we had an opportunity to partner with them, uh, or iCertis, which is another company coming out of Hyderabad and uh, and US, uh, at least a billion dollar plus valued company coming out of India. So you are seeing examples where companies started only a few years back, many of them including uh, Charge B, and now uh, almost doubling every year and growing rapidly and uh, having a world class uh, uh, SaaS metrics which is considered kind of outstanding metrics. Many of our companies coming out of India are demonstrating that. So there is a proof point that it is possible to build large scale companies coming out of India, but with all the optionality what Krish talked about. Right. And uh, you also mentioned the word at the beginning and now, right? The word ARR, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. it's could include the audience. Broader audience. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to touch upon that part yeah. and the beauty of SaaS mm-hmm. revenue, which is ARR is annual recurring revenue. Right. And the beauty of SaaS is, right, we all hated Windows long time, not long time back when 98 or 90 Windows 95 wouldn't be compatible with the 2000 or Windows 10. Right. And then they would actually force you to pay a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Right. It almost felt like the business software vendor and the customer were orthogonal mm-hmm. in their interest. But the beauty of SaaS is that you win when the customer wins. And it's a recurring revenue stream, right? Which is what we call as a recurring revenue where the customer continues to automatically renew and pay you again and again. And you focus on acquiring new customers and then happily serving your existing customers, right? And when they when their consumption increases, they pay you a little bit more than what they paid the previous month. And this compounding effect of SaaS is what we call as an annual recurring revenue. And that's the beauty of SaaS, where the, investor, the interest of the customer and the software vendor are beautifully aligned together. Got it. So once they come in and from the consumer world, it's by like subscribing to a Netflix or any service where you keep paying them again, over and over again. Correct. Right. You use a side. single screen, you pay once, right? And then you have a family and then you want to share the account. Then they also have a plan for that. Yeah. Right. Then they pay you a little bit more. Yeah. So that's great. So last question on this section of why um, SaaS is exciting. And then we want to switch on how to go aboard as a founder. So maybe talk to us about um, what are the flavors of SaaS today that are exciting to either of you and and uh, maybe some that will help us segue into the next. And is 2020 a good time to start a SaaS company? There are two questions that you can start with. Either so, one. you know, Krish has an advantage of seeing all startups that actually make money on his <laughs> platform, <laughs> right? No, we, we and have, uh, we have an advantage of seeing SaaS startups that are pitching us. So you'll get the both views. Yes. And his, his exposure is global. Our exposure is a lot of entrepreneurs coming in India. Yeah. Right. So if you look at that, uh, the flavor, um, there are today 2000 categories and probably around 100,000 software, SaaS software developer or companies serving under 2000 categories across small, medium, large companies. Right, this is the surface. But if you look at total purchase of software today, people are buying and spending almost $500 billion per year in software purchases. Whereas the SaaS industry itself is somewhere between 150 to 200 million, billion. right? Uh, 200 billion, 150 to 200 billion. So there is another 300 billion of old style software that is going on premise, still being bought, that has to be replaced. That is the first opportunity. The second opportunity is the software that has been built, even custom built, even today, 
over the last 40 years, and you look at even or any of the services companies, IBM, Oracle, or sorry, uh, Infosys, Wipro, TCS, Accenture, Cognizant, any company, they have massive projects going on even today, building custom software for a specific customer, which means that they are all opportunities to create a product out of them so it can be sold to multiple people. So that will be multi-trillion dollar software that exists that requires conversion into SaaS model. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the size of this industry, probably it's going to be quite there for at least next 20, 30 years, it feels for me. And software change takes some uh, effort, but it, it will be the companies coming up with, startups coming up with new ideas, building great products, and so that people shut down their old custom software and move into the new software. That's one flavor. The second flavor is the new industries and new digitization that is happening and new opportunities that there were no software before, but people are building it today. And, you know, for example, even Krish's company itself is because there are a lot of SaaS companies, they need subscription engine, therefore this company is born. This is like uh, shovels for gold diggers. Yes. And right. more and more are happening in, in that category, whether you look at real estate. We have companies in real estate where visibility is the problem. I want to know how my building's energy consumption is, or AC consumption is, or the temperature. All details are available in different buildings. I want to centralize it. There was no software before. There was no tech before. Now with IoT, bringing all this together, decisions can be made faster, which I call it as a visibility a category of visibility, whether it is in pharma company or supply chain or real estate or healthcare or drug, uh, pharma drug delivery, it doesn't matter which industry you take, you need to know the visibility of how products and services are moving across the boundary of uh, companies to states to countries and how it reaches the end user. And then that level of that is a massive opportunity that is coming out. So there are so much of opportunity in general in terms of building new software as a service to these new industries that's coming out. Software eating the world. Is that it? That is right. Right. Yeah. And software as a service eating software. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say that is, yeah. uh, uh, just like I come from 10 years of service experience in Fortune 500 customers. And personally, one of the products, the products that I was implementing, we used to have a budget of uh, close to $6 million that was spent annually in, of which only $1 million went to the software vendor, mm -hmm. right? The four to $5 million was paid to us as service partners for maintenance of the software, continuous improvement and customer support and all of that. Imagine the same Fortune 500 company only pays probably $100,000 per month to the software as a service vendor who has now completely transformed itself into a software as a service company mm. and they probably pay one tenth of that price or even less to directly to them and there is no money left in the service part. So the beauty is when you think about it's not just software that is transforming into some other form. Instead, it's a budget that is available for software and the associated services that is all available which is actually at already a trillion dollar market mm. that is transforming into software as a service. Got it which is a beautiful opportunity, right? And the future of SaaS, right? We touched upon horizontal and vertical SaaS. I think in, in five to 10 years, the beautiful opportunity is when you think about any place, like a, let's say a dentist place where you think of uh, the booking managed through software and then eventual payment managed through software and maybe the doctor's records managed through it. And then you combine all of that, that could become a, a full stack software for managing dentist place. Mm. But if you take one level back, right, does the doctor really want to worry about how do I operate this place and all of that? The doctor cares about the patient. What if you can even zoom out and then think about a full stack offering where you are able to go and then say soup to nuts, I take care of everything and you can just go and then you are a great chef, come cook, delight your customers and then you walk away. Let me take care of everything else. Could even be the future of software as a service, right? That could be the evolution of where SaaS will go. Mm -hmm. When you think about how far you can actually go where you just take a part of the revenue of operating the entire place through software with service, combined services, could be the future of software. I think it's a very exciting opportunity where we, we, are, we are not even seeing that level of uh, full stack offerings yet, right? But that could also be the future. But if I were an entrepreneur today, I would still go back to actually building SaaS products simply because there is no other industry where I would want to start with solving a customer problem through software 
there is no place that is more exciting than this and it and we are only getting started through saas got it that that's all super maybe the last phase of this is you build this it scale what happens to these companies is there a is there a path to a liquidity or how is the market for companies built in this industry yeah. i i'll Go speak ahead. as an yeah. entrepreneur yeah. right yeah when we started <coughs> right you can speak from the vc perspective yeah. right as an entrepreneur right yeah. i didn't care about anything else all yeah. i wanted was we wanted to learn how to build a product company and if we can get take salary home we would have been very happy right as long as there were 100 happy customers and we could all take salaries home we didn't care about anything else right we would have kept doing that for 10 20 years but at every step you actually learn what else what more can i do now that i understand this opportunity then what am i going to do right and uh, girish beautifully calls this uh, girish uh, founder of freshworks calls this dreaming in installments mm-hmm. and that happens to all of us right uh, when we actually learn a little bit more about something like this so from a exit perspective or what is op- what next if you actually are someone who is on the fence about starting a saas company or you are working in a saas company and thinking okay i want to start a company i think there is nothing like actually learning so much more about uh, you grow as a person when you actually learn to build a company absolutely right that by itself is a reward the journey is a reward yeah in some sense right yeah. and then when you actually build companies at scale there are so many opportunities that actually just open up where there are more companies that actually say hey i want to acquire these companies because i have a huge customer base I would like to purchase your company and then go distribute that same software to my existing customer base. Yeah. Those kind of opportunities open up, right? Or you could actually make it really massive and then build it into hundreds of million dollars of uh, revenue and then build it into a very large company, right? Those may be fewer, but there is also plenty of um, successful stories all the way between the one million dollar, hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars. Uh, there are several pathways that are actually available. Is is my perspective? Got it. Great, Shaker. Yeah. So you know, if you look at it, um, I feel knowing the knowledge and the advantage and the effort required, it is becoming. Uh, if you spend the right time, uh, it is relatively uh, a, a good way. One can build somewhere between million to five million dollars of uh, annual recurring revenue via bootstrapping method or from small angel money. But you have to pick your playbooks right, and once you cross. Between five and ten million dollar uh, revenue, which means whether you raise money or not, options on the table are phenomenal. Which means there is significant advantage of that company being acquired if you don't want to continue, or if you want to continue, you can also raise money to scale faster. And and lastly, if you do land on a really large opportunity and you are scaling rapidly and you see hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, revenue, then you can also list. in the public market and build a iconic companies that uh, you know goes beyond you and build company that lasts uh, long enough and uh, create a, a company that uh, you know creates uh, jobs uh, satisfaction to the customers and so, so serves the problem that the world needs so there are so many opportunities in 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 my mind uh, when you start and uh, you know just starting is the most important thing here great so there's Yeah, there's bootstrapping continuing on as a profitable company. There's companies that scale, and there's a very active exit uh, like M and A market there. And then there are companies that have scaled and gone public, and it's one of the most active uh, spaces in the public markets as well. So the world is your option, as you're saying, right? So that and in Jason Lemkin's words, right? Once you cross ten million dollar with momentum, you yeah. basically almost become unkillable in SaaS mm-hmm. because of the recurring revenue nature of the business. Hope you enjoyed this conversation with Shaker and Krish. We discussed the evolution of SaaS subscription as a new alternative revenue model, the various types of SaaS businesses, and the advantages of starting a SaaS company from India. We will continue this conversation with Shaker and Krish in the next podcast with more specific advice for founders who have already embarked on this SaaS startup journey. You can find more podcasts at InsightsPodcast.in. and also look forward to hearing from you at axel_india on twitter please do follow us on spotify apple podcast or wherever you prefer listening to your podcasts and we would greatly appreciate if you can leave your reviews there so that other listeners can discover this podcast thank you